When I gave the opening statement on behalf of the House managers, we told you that we wanted you to hear from the witnesses and see the documents. And so we're going to continue to do this. On your screen, we're going to start with Article 1. Now, we don't have enough time to go through every piece of paper that was introduced at trial and every word that was uttered under oath. But we suggest that you look at these key exhibits related to Article 1. To summarize, the Texas Attorney General wields astonishing power and is required to use that power to protect charities. In fact, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has called it the public protector of charities. But instead of protecting the Mitty Foundation, Paxton forced his office into the Mitty lawsuit over the objections of the Charitable Trust Division solely to help Nate Paul and his companies. Mr. Paxton's obsession with helping Nate Paul manifested itself in the Mitty litigation when he demanded his deputies try to halt the lawsuit and force the charity to accept Mr. Paul's lowball settlement offer. Mr. Paxton claimed that the office needed to intervene to save the Mitty Foundation from excessive attorney's fees. But in reality, his actions harmed the charity by causing it to respond to frivolous motions and demands. Instead of protecting charities, Mr. Paxton harmed the Mitty Foundation only because he wanted to help Nepal. Now, in addition to exhibits, you will hear, you heard testimony proving evidence in Article 1. Here is just one of the highlights from Mr. Bangert. He, he directed us to intervene. It was clear to me the intervention would benefit world-class holdings in Nepal. Article 2. Same thing trying to be compressed on time, but I want to give you a highlight of some of the, exhi the exhibits that we want to direct you to. You can write these down and look at them later during deliberations. To summarize, Mr. Paxton abused his office, forcing his employees to draft the midnight opinion to help Nate Paul avoid impending foreclosure sales. He became involved in the drafting of an opinion for the first time ever. He covered up his misdeeds by creating a straw requester, a Senate chairman, to hide the fact that he had no valid requester as required by Chapter 402 of the Government Code. The letter was clearly a 402 opinion, and the Office of Attorney General knew that. Why else go to all the trouble to find an authorized requester? It doesn't make sense. Even though the Attorney General's office had been promoted as Texas is open for business during COVID. And Governor Abbott's emergency COVID order had expressly permitted real estate transactions to continue without limitation. Mr. Paxton forced his employees to stop foreclosure sales based on the phony claim that COVID made these outdoor sales on the courthouse steps dangerous. To accomplish this purpose, he forced his employees to reverse their legal conclusions, and they told you that, so that Nate Paul could benefit from a legal opinion published at 1 o'clock on a Sunday morning. The very next day, Nate Paul attempted to use the opinion letter to halt foreclosures in his properties. On your screen is Exhibit 657. Articles 3 and 4. Same thing. We have listed some of the top exhibits that we suggest you look at when you deliberate. To summarize, Mr. Paxton does not dispute that the law enforcement exception is designed to predict victims, law enforcement, informants, and practices. It is also undisputed that Mr. Paxton directed his employees to act contrary to the law enforcement exception and release confidential information related to an ongoing investigation. It is not a coincidence that Nate Paul had pending lawsuits concerning the open records request and the AG's no opinion, no position opinion endorsed disclosing sealed documents. It is not a coincidence that even though there are over 40,000 open records rulings each year, 
that Nate's request is the first and the only time that Mr. Paxton ever cared about anything in the Open Records Division. Now, after his advisors warned him repeatedly not to release law enforcement records relating to an ongoing investigation, Mr. Paxton insisted that the office issue the no position letter. The House has also established that Mr. Paxton provided Nate Paul with confidential information. It would be impossible for Nate Paul to know the specific details of who signed the sealed probable cause affidavit in connection with the application for the search warrant without being improperly provided that information by Paxton. In May, Mr. Paxton obtained a copy of the DPS file. That information was in there. He had the file for seven to 10 days. The DPS file was in an, a manila envelope. It was testified it was a quarter inch or less in thickness. According to Mr. Wicker, in May or June of 2020, he handed off a manila envelope to Nate Paul at Nate Paul's office. In a meeting on August 5th, 2020, with Penley and Maxwell, Nate Paul and his lawyer presented a presentation titled Operation Longhorn, revealing that he knew the identity of the affiant and the probable cause affidavit that still remains sealed. There was also witness testimony explaining that Mr. Paxton asked that the information related to the ongoing law enforcement investigation be released. Listen to Mr. Vassar. Was there a clear clash here between what the judicial system had decided somebody that should be, that should be sealed versus a man under investigation seeking the sealed information? Yes, that was my opinion. And it was the information he was seeking potentially harmful and dangerous to other people. It is closed. I, I believe so, to the extent it revealed the, the law enforcement information within the, the probable cause affidavit, the investigators that were involved, and uh, other government officials that participated in the decision. And still more. What did the Attorney General say in this meeting? He asked us to review the file. He asked us what, what our interpretation of the file was. He told us that he had spoken personally with Mr. Paul. He said that he believed that something bad had happened to Mr. Paul. He felt that Mr. Paul was being railroaded by the FBI and by DPS. And General Paxton said that he didn't trust law enforcement. Um, he asked us to find a way to release the information that had been requested to be withheld. So despite his staff telling him you can't release this type of information, despite Mr. Paxton's claim that the decision did not release any documents, the no position letter, that opinion, still created precedent that could help Nate Paul and could help others obtain confidential information. Listen to Mr. Banger about precedent. If our office refuses to take a position on an issue like that and the court sees that, that is a strong signal, I believe, to the court. And I've been a lawyer for over a decade, probably close to two. Um, that's a strong signal to the court about the attorney general's view of that file, that we would have gone out of our way to render a vastly uncharacteristic decision. Let's talk about Article 5. Here's a summary of some of the key exhibits that we direct you to in your deliberations. Highlights, Mr. Paxton secretly signed a contract to hire Brandon Kamak, a five-year lawyer with no prosecutorial experience to commence a criminal investigation into Nate Paul's enemies. Mr. Paxton hired Kamak September 4th, 2020, and unbeknownst to his deputies, fully executed the contract three weeks later on September 28th. Paxton alone supervised Kamek's work, in which Nate Paul and his attorney, Michael Wynn, directed. 
Paxton thought it would be a good idea for Kamek to obtain grand jury subpoenas that would have allowed Nate Paul to get the private email and telephone records of law enforcement agents who investigated Nate Paul, lenders, and opposing counsel. Now, pursuant to the Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 20A, I ask you to write that down. Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 20, big capital A. The ability to obtain grand jury subpoenas is a prosecutorial act. It is not a tool available to outside counsel hired by the Office of Attorney General who has not been appointed an attorney pro tem. Now, let's talk about what that is. An attorney pro tem is appointed when a DA, when a DA, recuses herself, and it is a formal process in which that district attorney goes to the court and asks for permission to be recused. Kamak was not an attorney pro tem, but Paxton still permitted Kamak to obtain grand jury subpoenas just like he was. Thus, Paxton was illegally attempting to use Kamak as an attorney pro tem when under the law, which this legislature writes, says that cannot be. Paxton communicated with Kamek using only private encrypted communications like Signal and Proton Mail and extra phones. The two talked several times a week, and Kamek updated him about his work as a special prosecutor. Let's talk about that real quick. Even though Mr. Paxton called Kamek a special prosecutor, a term special prosecutor didn't exist. He clearly wasn't one. A special prosecutor is when a DA appoints someone to assist with their cases. And that person is not on the payroll at the district attorney's office, but is sworn in by the district attorney and becomes an assistant DA. And a special prosecutor, the DA continues to supervise the handling of their case. Kamak was not sworn in and was not supervised by the Travis County District Attorney's Office. Let's listen to the testimony of former DA Margaret Moore. In what way? It is astonishingly untruthful. There is no way that anyone could interpret the facts as my appointing Mr. Kamak as a special prosecutor. I couldn't pick him out of a lineup today. I don't know him. So he wasn't a special prosecutor and he wasn't an attorney pro tem. Let's hear from By Mr. that Mateen. time, the 29th, because the next day is when we go to the FBI and DOJ. By that time, I, had inclu I, I, I concluded that you know, Mr. Paxton was engaged in, 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 in conduct that was immoral, unethical, and, and I had a good faith belief that, that it was illegal. This entire investigation by Mr. Kamek was illegal. Let's listen to Ranger Maxwell. Now, um, would you agree with me, Ranger, that despite your concern or belief or hope, uh, that Mr. Wynn or Mr. Paul would say something incriminating or say something that would, would cause them exposure criminally, neither Mr. Wynn nor Mr. Paul ever ask you to do anything illegal. Yes, they asked me to interfere with a federal investigation, which is absolutely illegal. It's all me. obstruction of justice. Show me, Ranger, in the first hour or the second two hours on the investigation or the interview of July 12th, 21st or August 5th. You've got the transcript there for both of those. Uh, Counselor, you, you are showing me the evidence right here. This is a, it's a um, map of how he wanted the investigation to be done and to have the AG's office follow how this was to be investigated along with targeting six individuals. I don't Where they say, you say you reviewed the transcripts of the July 12th interview 
and you have reviewed the transcripts of the August 5th interview, show me the language where in either one of those interviews, Ranger, that they ask you to commit a crime. They're not in the interviews, Counselor. They are in the document you're looking at right now. He lists six people as a person of interest to be targeted in this investigation. Where does right it happen? It's an Operation sorry. Longhorn. What crime is Mr. Wynn or Mr. Um, Paul asking you to commit by tendering this PowerPoint to you? They entered the PowerPoint and gave it to us to map out how they felt our investigation that they wanted to be created should go. What crime is committed, Ranger, by them asking you to investigate the legality of a search warrant? What crime is that? In my professional opinion, to create this investigation and follow through it would be obstruction of justice and interfering with a federal investigation. And finally, I ask you also to listen, recall testimony of Mr. McCarty. And uh, did you learn or see subpoenas, the grand jury subpoenas that had been issued to players in the Mitty Foundation case? I saw a grand, a criminal grand jury subpoena that had been issued to a bank. What was your reaction to that? I was stunned. What do you mean? Explain it. I saw a criminal grand jury subpoena directed to a bank that was clearly seeking information that would have aided world-class Nate Paul's um, efforts against the Mitty Foundation. Why is that bad? Well, it's lawyer, one, one thing is it's lawyer ethics 101, so that was the first thing that came to my mind. We are weaponizing the criminal process to aid a civil litigant, and that is a big no-no. Ethics 101. And Mr. Paxton has not disputed the testimony of Mr. McCarty. Now, Brent Webster, on behalf of Mr. Paxton, misled the Senate Finance Committee by stating that he had proof that Mr. Kamek was an attorney pro tem because he was allegedly being supervised by the Travis County DA's office. I remind you of this testimony. This is... I want to talk about the appointment of special prosecutors, and I don't know if you or the general need to answer that. This is it rare for your office to appoint a special prosecutor? So, uh, is this a general question about special prosecutors? Is that just for the AG's office in general? Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to address that. So, um, I would actually rather General Paxton would address it, but if he knows this like backwards and forwards, he was a prosecutor, so he knows this issue very well. Well, I'm wondering who uh, hired Brandon Kamak. Right. So if I can address that. Sure. Um, so the, our office entered into a contract for Brandon, with Brandon Kamak to be outside counsel. Um, and so he was serving as outside counsel for the AG's office. Now, I have, uh, through the process of, I started, as you know, in October after this happened, I have interviewed ADAs from Travis County, and I've seen documents from Travis County that prove the fact that the Travis County DA's office made Brandon Kamick a special prosecutor. We did not make Brandon Kamick a special prosecutor. That was the, within the purview of the Travis County DA's office. Um, so the special prosecutor word gets confusing at times because there's two types. One type of special prosecutor is a pro tem prosecutor, and a pro tem prosecutor can only be put in place when, in a, when, a, when a DA's office recuses themselves from a case. And that's not what happened with the Brandon Kamick situation. We hired him to be outside counsel. That contract was signed by the general. And then he went to go work because he was hired on to assist 
the Travis County DA's office. And the news glosses this over. No one ever goes and looks at the Travis County DA's office's files. They don't give really deep interviews on these things. But the fact is, he went and said, I'm the guy that's going to be the outside counsel for the AG's office, and I'm here to assist on your investigation. And then through that process, he worked with them to get grand jury subpoenas, and that's how he became a special prosecutor. And I'm aware of the difference. I actually wrote the legislation that determined on pro tem who could actually be appointed. So, yes, I'm familiar with it. This body knows the law. On September 29th of 2020, Jeff Mateer was leading a Zoom meeting about opioid litigation when he received an urgent message that there was an emergency. Mateer knew that some, it was something important. He learned that an individual representing himself as a special prosecutor for the Office of the Attorney General and Nate Paul's personal attorney had served a grand jury subpoena on a bank seeking information relating to Nate Paul and his activities. This was a crisis moment. Mateer called Bangert, Brickman, and other deputies who were in meetings at the Capitol. They assembled, shared the grand jury subpoena from the bank, and they were stunned and outraged. They realized that Mr. Paxton was using criminal grand jury subpoenas to aid Nate Paul's civil lawsuit against the Mitty Foundation. In that room, Bangert, Mays, McCarty, Penley, Vassar, and Brickman for the first time started to share from their puzzle pieces what their office was doing to benefit Nate Paul, not realizing how it all connected. The puzzle pieces came together that day, and they realized they had a massive problem. Concerns of bribery were raised. Mr. Paxson had allowed Nate Paul to infect the office at the highest level. Despite all their efforts, Mr. Paxton's senior staff realized they could not stop him. They believed that he had committed crimes and abused his office and that he had attempted to involve them. They knew they had no choice but to report them. Mr. Paxton's counsel has argued with each witness, save one, claiming that they should have spoken to Ken Paxton before they went to the FBI. However, this line of questioning ignored the months and months of warnings, conversations, and pleas from senior staff imploring that Mr. Paxton stop asking his office to do work for Nate Paul. Here's a video. We were protecting the interest of the state and ultimately, I believe, protecting the interest of the Attorney General and in my view, signing our professional death warrant at the same time. Let's hear what, Ms. what Ranger Maxwell had to say. I told him that uh, Nate Paul was a criminal. He was running a Ponzi scheme that would rival Billy Saul Estes, and that if he didn't get away from this individual and stop doing what he was doing, he was going to get himself indicted. And Mr. Mateer? I felt like we had been trying to protect Mr. Paxton. On several occasions, I'd gone to him, and, and, and really my, I mean, he had become, I mean, he was my boss. He'd become a friend. Um, I cared for him. I cared for Senator Paxton. And I wanted him, I wanted him, I mean, I think in one of the memos I say, come clean. I mean, I wanted You're to help what? And Mr. Penley. I told him that I was trying to be a loyal subordinate and a friend. And I still considered myself a friend, even up to that very day. And I was trying to walk him back from what I thought was a dangerous line he was trying to cross. And I told him all my reasons that he could face criminal charges, bribery, other things. It could be a media scandal. He could get himself in a lot of trouble. He needed to leave this alone, to back away from it. I explained all the, the practical investigation difficulties that we shouldn't be trying to investigate the feds. And there were many things we couldn't investigate. We didn't have the power. We didn't have a way to get at those sealed search warrants. That's the testimony that you've heard during this trial. Now, Mr. Paxton's response was swift, vicious, and wrongful. He followed the classic playbook of guilty. 
deflect, deceive, and demonize. Articles 6, 7, 8, and 15 detail Mr. Paxton's attempts to misuse state resources to conceal his bad conduct by lying and smearing the otherwise stellar reputations of his loyal staff. Again, we list out some of the exhibits that we would direct you to during your deliberations. Please write them down if you can. He used state resources to issue an internal OAG report before this last election that contained blatantly false statements and personal smears against the whistleblowers. Let me remind you of what Mr. Brickman said. In this report, if I asked you just to take several, four, three or four examples of, of things that you disagree with, have I asked you to do that? Yes. All right. What I was at, what I wanted to ask you is, in this report, how would you describe your reaction to it as accuracy as the terms of what happened in these matters involving Nate Paul? I would call this report a whitewash full of lies. Now, if I may, let's just go over to page five and do this real quickly. If I ask you to pick four or five samples, can you just do that for me? And, and would you look on page five and see as to the first claim? What is, un what is untrue about that claim? Right, it says, on two prior occasions involving Nate Paul's interests, the Open Records Division sided with the government agency against disclosing to Nate Paul. That is not true. There was an Open Records decision that took no opinion as to the release of the documents. On well, this number two here, uh, which says A.G. Paxson's involvement is consistent with his predecessors and in line with his required duties and legal obligations as Attorney General of Texas. Most relevant here, the position taken by the A.G. in this litigation was adverse to Nate Paul and in support of a higher settlement amount to be paid by Nate Paul to the Mitty Foundation as opposed to the prospect of continued and costly litigation that would disproportionately benefit the charity's court-appointed receiver and his lawyer. All right, the third claim. This informal guidance letter regarding foreclosure sales written by Bangert was made in response to requests for disaster council advice from Texas Senator Brian Hughes during the height of the pandemic and not for the benefit of Nate Paul. Is that a true or untrue statement? Is that a true or untrue statement? It is an untrue statement. The foreclosure opinion was for Nate Paul's benefit. Can we go to page six, please? Look at the top. Kamek legally, Kamek, Kamek legally and properly exercised authority delegated to him by both A.G. Paxton and the TCDAO Kamek was designated as outside counsel for OAG by A.G. Paxton, and he was also knowingly appointed as a special prosecutor by the Travis County DA's office. Is that a true or untrue statement? It is false. Mr. Paxton did not examine or cross-examine a single thing said by Blake Brickman. Every word he said is unrefuted. Let's look at a quick timeline. I want to remind you that the whistleblowers were all constructively terminated within 45 days of making their report to the Trump FBI. Mr. Paxton last attempted to silence those whistleblowers with his request to the taxpayers that the taxpayers pay $3.3 million in hush money. Even when he was specifically asked to justify the use of the money, he declined and refused. And that is why we are here. Mr. Paxton refuses to take any responsibility for abusing the esteemed office that he holds. Let's look at Articles 9 and 10. In exchange for abusing his office to help Nate Paul, Mr. Paxton reaped tangible benefits. What we know is that Nate Paul gave Mr. Paxton's mistress a job so that she could move from San Antonio to Austin to be closer, provided free Uber rides, to her apartment. And Nate Paul provided renovations, free renovations to Mr. Paxton's Austin home until he was caught. And I'll show you that in just a minute. Look at this next chart. It has a lot of data on it, but just look at the colors for me. 
This chart is a demonstrative based on Exhibit 700. Exhibit 700. Marked in orange are trips to and from Ms. Olson's residence, which is shown as Exhibit 699. Marked in blue are trips to Nate Paul's residence. Exhibit 700 shows that Nate Paul set up an Uber account for Dave P. The account facilitated a covert means for Paxton to maintain his affair. The ride chart in this exhibit contains the latitude and longitude for each pickup and drop off for Dave P. Focus on the rides between July 30th, 2020 and October 2nd, 2020, when the rides suddenly stop. October 2nd. Next, I show you this Uber exhibit also shows that the rides are paid for with a credit card linked to Nate Paul's billing address in Austin and not Ken Paxton's in Collin County. Not Ken Paxton's in Collin County. Next, I show you exhibit 699, which shows that Laura Olson was hired by World Class Property Company July 6th, 2020, and reports to Nate Paul. Let's talk about a timeline that's really important. You've seen a lot of documents, but let's take a moment. I want to show you this timeline. It's important. This shows when Paxton found out about the whistleblower report to the FBI and the actions that he took immediately after that. Now, Penley emails Kamek to tell him to cease and desist at 918 on September 30th, 918 in the morning. At 1035 that morning, Kamek forwards the email to Paxton's Proton mail address. Kamek relentlessly calls Paxton that morning as well. Only four hours later, Paxton decides to pay the Cupertino builders for renovation work completed in July. Completed in July, but we're paying them now, September 30th. He returns to Austin and arrives at the airport at 10 p.m. At 10.57 p.m., Dave P. takes an Uber to Nate Paul's house. Dave P. was picked up one block from Paxton's residence. The next day, October 1st, that was the 30th, the next day, October 1st, Cupertino Builders creates an invoice for Paxton at 7.50 p.m. The records show that this invoice was never sent to Mr. Paxton. That night, October 1st, Dave P. takes his last ride to the Pearl Lantana Apartments, where Laura Olson lives. We tried to call her as a witness. The court announced that she was present but unavailable to testify. Next, this is an invoice from Nate Paul's guy, Raj, never sent to Paxton. He created it after it was due, and the metadata tells us so. The metadata tells us it was created on October 1, yet Mr. Paxton decided to make payment on September 30th for work that had been completed in July. This is Exhibit 703. These are emails. Why does Nate Paul need to know the schedule for the renovations? at the Paxton's home in Austin? Why does Nate Paul need 20 photos of the new flooring in the Paxton's home in Austin? Mr. Wicker testified that he heard Kevin Wood tell Mr. Paxton, I will have to check with Nate at least three times. Kevin Wood, who avoided being served multiple times with subpoenas in this matter. There are no coincidences in Austin. Nate Paul was paying for these home renovations until it all got found out. Articles 16 through 20. They charge that Mr. Paxton and Nate Paul's scheme to use the powers of the Office of Attorney General constituted dereliction of duty, made him unfit for office, and abused the public trust. These articles ask the Senate to do exactly what Mr. Paxton's counsel is begging you not to do. To look at the entirety of Mr. Paxton's conduct. And when the Senate does so, there is no reasonable doubt that Mr. Paxton committed the acts set forth in these articles and that these acts 
were an abuse of office and a breach of public trust. The witnesses have explained to you that Mr. Paxton conspired with Nate Paul and others to harass and intimidate their perceived enemies. While Mr. Paxton's attorney suggests that there must be some type of overtly stated agreement if people are going to conspire, he also knows there are no coincidences in Austin. Mr. Paxton was using an inordinate amount of the OAG's resources for Nate Paul. Listen in. Well, when the Attorney General kept raising Nate Paul issues of the ones that we've gone through so far and later in the future, do you have any idea what kind of, how much time or resources that were devoted to dealing with Nate Paul instead of real concerns? We were devoting far more resources to Nate Paul than we ever should have given the importance of those issues. The burden of proof in this case is beyond a reasonable doubt. But what does that mean? It means exactly what the words say. Is there doubt? And is it reasonable? Even though this isn't a criminal trial, every day in this country, criminal defendants are convicted of crimes beyond a reasonable doubt with much less evidence than you have seen in this trial. We admitted over 3,000 pages of documents and seven days worth of testimony. And that will all be accessible to you in your deliberations. When we first started our case, it might have been unclear what all the evidence was. And that doubt was reasonable since Mr. Paxton was presumed innocent. But as more evidence came in, the picture became clearer and the doubt faded. The puzzle pieces came together. The law does not require that we exclude all doubt. When we have shown you enough evidence that you can see what the puzzle is showing, that you know what the picture is, then we have met our burden. Now, Mr. Paxton's counsel would urge you that we have to put every piece in the puzzle there for it to be a picture, but that is not what our burden is. The burden is satisfied. Is it a coincidence that Paxton ordered his people to intervene in the MIDI lawsuit when they had already waived intervention? Is it a coincidence that Nate Paul used the midnight opinion to stop a foreclosure sale one day after the opinion was issued? Is it a coincidence that while discussing the Paxton home renovations, Mr. Paxton's contractor told him at least three times, I will have to check with Nate. Is it a coincidence that Nate Paul gave Ken Paxton's mistress, Laura Olson, a job while Mr. Paxton was doing Nate's bidding? Is it a coincidence that within 45 days of reporting to the Trump FBI, every whistleblower, whistleblower was terminated or constructively discharged? My counsel talked about $25,000 campaign contribution from Nate Paul in 2018. And he told you that Mr. Paxton is a fundraising machine. Well, in our world, that is a good campaign donor. That is a donor that you have a race. The next year you pick up the phone and you call. That's, there should be a campaign donation in 2019. Where is that? There should be a campaign donation in 2020. That is a good donor. Is it a coincidence that there is no longer campaign contributions? There are no coincidences in Austin. Members of the jury, this is the most important choice you have ever faced. In a hundred years, it's probably the only vote that anyone will ever talk about in your careers. It will also decide what Texas politics look like. Not just to the way cynical people outside this chamber think, but this is about what does public service mean. Public service. To Mr. Paxton, it meant serving himself and his friend Nate Paul. Mr. Paul brought incredible wealth and a lavish lifestyle to the partnership. And Mr. Paxton brought the incredible power of the state. 
And the defense here isn't that he didn't do it. It's that it doesn't matter because he won the election. You know, Mr. Kinghorn summed it up in his testimony yesterday. The office of the Attorney General of the state of Texas is Mr. Paxton's law firm, and he is the firm's only client. He directs it to serve himself, not the people of Texas. If you vote to condone that, then high office will simply be the most profitable choice for any self-serving crook, and it won't even have to be hidden. You're here despite political pressure because you believe that public service is a calling that you put people first. You have everything in common with the whistleblowers. Each a faithful servant who has spent years fighting for their values with great integrity. Look at what Mr. Paxton did to them. Think of Ranger Maxwell. In September of 2020, he was a Hall of Fame hero with 40 years of experience, a man of honor above reproach. One month later, that lifetime of service meant nothing. When he was an obstacle to Mr. Paxton, he was suddenly a liar, a rogue, a liability that had to be fired. We say we back the blue in this building but Mr. Paxton tossed him out with the others like the garbage. If you don't hold Mr. Paxton accountable, that could happen to any of us. Your entire legacy could be erased and rewritten on the whim of whoever wins the next election. That is a godless, rudderless morality. And it cannot be the new normal for Texas. We must have a shared standard of integrity, honesty, and service that transcends any election. Your vote will set that standard. Mr. Mr. Mayor, you have 10 minutes left. Now, the beginning of trial, we watched all of you place your hand on Sam Houston's Bible and take your oath. Sam Houston's Bible. At that time, I reminded you that Sam Houston told Texans, do right and risk the consequences. Now is your time to do right. Mr. President. Mr. Leach, is next. Mr. Leach you have about nine minutes. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, distinguished members of the Senate, my fellow House members, General Paxton, and to the people of Texas. Let's be very clear. Um, none of us want to be here today. I don't, and I'm confident that you don't either. But here we are with a heavy and historic moment in front of us. I stand before you today humbly on behalf of the House Board of Managers to offer a few brief closing remarks. These remarks have not been reviewed by anyone. I didn't go to dinner with TLR last night. George P. Bush didn't have his speechwriter draft this for me. Carl Rove's not sitting in my office right now. This is me and me alone. Ten days ago, as these proceedings commenced, I watched each of you, I sat right over here, and I watched each of you, senators, place your hand one by one on Sam Houston's Bible, swearing to impartially render a verdict based on the law and the evidence. And as Chairman Murr has just articulately outlined for you, the House Board of Managers believe that that evidence meets the high standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. And as strong as we believe the evidence to be, make no mistake, this is not an easy vote for you. It's not. 
It shouldn't be. And I trust that it's not. It wasn't for me. This will, if you're like me, be the hardest vote, the most difficult vote, the heaviest vote that you will ever cast in your time in the legislature. This proceeding, we've had a lot of discussion about whether this proceeding is civil or criminal in nature. And, and as we've, we've learned, it's been a unique mix of both. But it's also very personal. The vote that each of you will cast, I should say the 16 votes that each of you will cast, will be very personal. And they should be. We should treat the heaviness and uh, the historic nature of this moment with the weight that it deserves. Members, senators, I certainly have done so. In voting to impeach General Ken Paxton, my dear friend, a political mentor, a brother in Christ, and a once trusted advisor, this has not just been a hard vote. This has been one of the most difficult things I've ever had to do in my life. Mr. Busby, you said in your closing that we're here because we hate Ken Paxton, and you could not be more wrong. I have loved Ken Paxton for a long time. I've done life with Ken Paxton. We've traveled together, attend church together attended countless Cowboys and Baylor football games together. Heck, we're both former Baylor student body presidents. In five minutes. I've block walked for Ken. I've donated to Ken, supported Ken. I've asked others to do the same. The first bill that I ever passed in the legislature in 2013, the only bill I passed that session, was sponsored by then Senator Ken Paxton. Which is one of the reasons that this is so difficult for me and many of our House members, and I know for many of you, it will be as well. Over the years, Ken and I have spent hours on the phone together. We've texted. We've called. For the first years when he, after he was elected Attorney General, when he took office, I had an open door to the Attorney General's office. I could go up to the eighth floor anytime and visit with my friend. We talked politics and policy. We talked life. Members, I know, as I look across this floor, many of you had the same. But a few years ago, those calls stopped, and that open door was closed. And I became increasingly concerned and alarmed at what I saw. Your Honor, he's testifying, and this is not proper. This is not based on any evidence in this case. It's improper. Mr. Busby, this is closing argument. I understand what it is, but I'm just saying he's talking about personal things that were not put into evidence. Mr. Busby and Mr. Leach, the jury will decide what is evidence. Okay. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Members, Senators, this has been, the point is, I know it's not lost on you, Senators. This is difficult for me. It's been difficult for many of us, and I know it will be difficult for you, and it should be. While the law and the evidence is clear, this is a personal vote for you, and it should be. But make no mistake, we shouldn't have to be here. I, like many of you, in response to those concerns, attempted to get answers, to have conversations, to schedule meetings. I called Senator or General Paxton in front of our committee 12 times this session, and not once did he appear in front of our committee for answers. And with all due respect to my friend, Mr. Cogdell, we do not, as legislators, have to go through private counsel to have access to a statewide official. Senator Huffman, if you wanted to meet and have Comptroller Hager come in front, from, in front of your committee, you don't have to go to his private counsel. Senator Creighton, you don't have to contact Mike Morath's private lawyer for him to come in front of your committee. Not once did he come answer questions, in public or in private, which is largely one of the reasons that we're here today, because the people of Texas deserve answers, and the legislature, the Senate, and the House expected to get those answers. Members, in closing, I see some of the whistleblowers are here in the gallery this morning. These are men and women of high esteem, character, conservative to the core. And you courageously spoke out, knowing the consequences and taking the risk, much like all of us have had to do and will have to do with this vote. I want you to know that the House has seen you and heard you. 
Mr. Maxwell, I see you. You deserve more than to be ridiculed and mocked on the floor of the Texas Senate. We hear you and we see you. The House has, and I'm confident that the Senate will as well. In closing, one of my favorite quotes is a quote of Martin Luther King. He says that, quote, cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expedience asks the question, is it politic? And vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time for each of us. There will come a time for you. I believe this is it. Not to ask yourself what is safe or popular or politic, but what is right. And I believe that it is right, as painful as it might be, for us and for you to vote to sustain the articles of impeachment commended to you by the Texas House of Representatives. It's an honor to serve with each of you. I pray God's grace and favor and his wisdom and discernment over you as you deliberate and vote on this historic matter. May God bless you, senators, and may God bless the people of Texas.